Welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of de Quervain's tenosynovitis. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The wonderful images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung R85 Prestige ultrasound unit. We're going to review a couple cases of de Quervain's tenosynovitis, and I'll highlight key teaching points throughout. Let's start by reviewing anatomy. Here we're looking at an MRI of the distal wrist and axial view. You can see the radius and the ulna. Above we have the dorsal side of the wrist, below we have the ventral side of the wrist. And there are six extensor compartments of the wrist containing single or multiple tendons. But for the purposes of this examination, we're only going to focus on compartment one, so don't worry about the rest for now. <laughs> and compartment one just contains two tendons, the extensor pollicis brevis tendon dorsally and the abductor pollicis longus tendon ventrally. Notice that the abductor pollicis longus tendon is abbreviated APL, similar to an apple. I like to think of this as an apple hanging off of a tree branch. That's how I remember that this is the more ventral tendon in the sheath. I might be biased because I live in New England and I'm thinking more about apples as fall is approaching, but maybe that learning tool will help you. All right, let's look at case one. This was a female patient in her 30s that had pain and a palpable lump on the radial and slightly ventral aspect of her wrist, worsening with heavy use. So here we're looking at an x-ray of the right wrist. Here's a frontal and an oblique view. And do you see anything? It's a subtle finding, but there is some mild soft tissue swelling over that radial styloid. And this is actually where the compartment one tendons extend. The APL will come and insert on the base of the first metacarpal, whereas the EPB will continue to the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. So now if we put the ultrasound transducer directly over this region and turn on short axis, this is what we'll see. So there's the EPB tendon, there's the APL tendon, here's the underlying radius. And we can see that there's a hypoechoic thickened extensor retinaculum overlying these tendons. When we turn on long axis, we see similar findings. There's that thickened extensor retinaculum, the underlying tendon of compartment one, and then there's the distal radius. When we add color Doppler, this is microvascular flow, there's some mild hyperemia about that retinaculum and tendon. And this is a typical appearance for de Quervain's tenosynovitis. So this is a stenosing tenosynovitis of the first extensor compartment. And it's actually the second most common hand entrapment tendinopathy after trigger finger, which occurs on the flexor side of the finger. We see this most commonly in middle-aged females. Causes include repetitive hand motions, hormonal changes during pregnancy, arthritis, and also trauma. Clinically, patients will often present with pain with thumb and wrist movement, tenderness and swelling at the radial styloid, and a positive Finkelstein maneuver may be present. That maneuver involves grasping the thumb and then ulnarly deviating the hand, eliciting pain over that distal radius due to stretching of the extensor compartment one tendons. What we'll see on ultrasound is increased fluid in the extensor compartment one tendon sheath, indicating tenosynovitis. Here we can see fluid surrounding that EPB tendon. The tendons themselves may become hypoechoic and edematous and thickened, indicating tendinosis, and we'll see thickening of that overlying extensor retinaculum. As is frequently the case with musculoskeletal ultrasound, comparison scanning of the normal asymptomatic side is often quite helpful. And you can see here on the symptomatic right side that thickening of the retinaculum measures almost 0.2 centimeters, but on the normal left side, it's quite thin. This is a normal retinaculum measuring only 0.02 centimeters. And let's look at this right side on short axis imaging. In real time, here we're at the level of the radius, and these are the compartment one tendons at the musculotendinous junction. Here, as we move proximal to distal, you can see these compartment one tendons are crossing over the extensor compartment two. And let's keep an eye on this compartment one as we move distally towards the radial styloid. You can see the extensor retinaculum is starting to come into view, very thick and hypoechoic there. So there's that thickened hypoechoic extensor retinaculum over the APL and the EPB, some fluid around that EPB, continuing a bit more distally. Here, notice how the APL tendon has a somewhat striated appearance with these hypochoric slips. This is a normal appearance, sometimes described as a lotus root. Do not confuse this with longitudinal tear. Let's continue a bit more distally. You'll notice that the EPB starts to branch off as it heads towards its insertion onto the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. And then the APL will continue on to insert on the base of the first metacarpal. All right, let's look at case two. So this was a female in her late 20s that presented with left wrist and thumb pain that began during the late stages of her pregnancy. So here again, we're starting with an x-ray this time of the left wrist. 
And do you notice anything there? There's a very subtle soft tissue swelling over that radial styloid, similar to the prior case. If we cone in that image a bit more, do you notice anything else? There's some very subtle cortical erosion here, this lucency with some surrounding sclerosis. So that's another finding we may see on x-ray as the query veins progresses. Now again, if we put the ultrasound transducer right here at the radial styloid and turn in short axis, here we have the APL tendon again, the EPB tendon, the underlying radius, and then the overlying thickened hypoechoic extensor retinaculum. Now we're looking at this on a sagittal view. We're sweeping from the APL to the EPB. There's that thickened heterogeneous extensor retinaculum. There's the underlying distal radius. And in between that, we have the extensor compartment one tendon. So there's the APL and then EPB. APL, EPB. Notice that the APL is thickened, hypoechoic, and there's some buckling there. Now, if we want to evaluate that dynamically, we'll have the patient abduct the thumb since it's the abductor pollicis longus. And notice how there's some bunching up of the tendon there at the level of the retinaculum. So there's some restricted movement there due to this thickened extensor retinaculum. And that's a finding we'll see with more advanced de Quer veins. And here's a static view of that long axis with the thickened retinaculum. When we add color Doppler or microvascular flow in this case, notice how hyperemic that retinaculum is, much more pronounced than the prior case, which suggests more advanced involvement. So again, as de Quer veins tenosynovitis progresses, we may start to see impaired tendon movement, which is one of the roles of ultrasound. Also, ultrasound can help differentiate tendinosis versus tear. And in this case, we just have tendinosis, which you can identify as hypoechoic edematous enlargement. But if you start seeing anechoic clefts within the tendon, that suggests tear. But remember, the APL can normally have multiple slips, giving that lotus root appearance. Don't confuse that with longitudinal tear. Another potentially confusing feature about the APL tendon is that it can sometimes have an accessory tendon that will insert onto the abductor pollicis brevis muscle but once you're aware of that, you can recognize it as an anatomic variant. So the take-home point there is that the APL tendon sometimes likes to be deceptive. <laughs> and as disease progresses, we may see retinacular and peritendinous hyperemia. Now, as we turn back on short axis for this patient, there's a finding that's important to identify with ultrasound, and that's the presence of intertendinous septa. So here we can see there's the APL, which is heterogeneous and hypoechoic with tendinosis. And then notice that the EPB has asymmetric fluid surrounding it, and that's because we have an intertendinous septum between the two. Again, there's that thickened extensor retinaculum with some hyperemia, also some peritendinous hyperemia. So why is this important to identify? Well, it can help to properly guide steroid injection because if there's a septum between the two tendons and only one side of the sheath is injected, the other tendon won't gain the benefit of the steroid therapy. Also, patients that have a septum have an increased incidence of asymmetric tendon involvement, often the EPB. And if conservative therapy fails, surgical decompression of the retinaculum may be required. And that's seen a bit more commonly when a septum is present. This patient did actually require surgical decompression and the presence of a septum was confirmed at the time of surgery. All right, and here are some references that you may find useful if you want to learn more about ultrasound of Dequervain's tenosynovitis. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you found this educational. Thank you to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Apple or Spotify or by clicking the YouTube subscribe button. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, follow us on social media. Links are in the show notes or click the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.